This is number theory, lecture 21. And I was asked to do exercise 18 in section 2.5, which is on Euler's theorem. And in this section, exercise 18, which says the following, let G be the group Z mod 7Z star. So this is the multiplicative group. of units, what it's called, modulo seven. So seven's a prime. The congruence classes relatively prime to seven are one through six. One plus seven Z, two plus seven Z, up to six plus seven Z. And we want to find all the cyclic subgroups of G. So let's just recall the definition. <coughs> <coughs> so if G is a group in general, and A is any element of G, the cyclic subgroup generated by A is the set, or is the subgroup of the set, uh, consisting of all powers of A, A to the K, for all integers K. So this is E, A, A squared, A cubed, and so on, and also the inverses, E, A inverse, A minus 2, and so on. But of course, if G is finite, this is going to be a finite group, and if it's finite, it's also going to be just it's enough to look at just the positive powers of A. So let's compute the cyclic subgroup generated by A for all A in my group G, which is the multiplicative group modulo 7. So we have to look at six different cyclic subgroups. So if I take a equal to 1 plus 7z, the cyclic subgroup generated by A, this is just a set of all powers of 1 plus 7z. But of course, this is just 1 to the k plus 7z for all k. But 1 to any power is just 1. So the cyclic subgroup generated by 1 plus 7z it's just a one element subgroup consisting of the multiplicative identity, the unit, one plus seven Z. So this is one cyclic subgroup contained in G. So as I take A equal to two plus seven Z. So we have to look at the powers of two plus seven Z. So we have two plus seven Z, of course, to the first power is just two plus seven Z. Two plus seven Z squared is two squared or four plus seven Z. And two plus seven Z cubed is two cubed, that's eight plus seven Z, which is one plus seven Z because eight is congruent to one mod seven. So the cyclic subgroup generated by two plus seven Z consists of three congruence classes. You have this to the zeroth power, one plus seven Z, two plus seven Z, and four plus seven Z. Every power of two plus seven Z is congruent to, every, con every power of two is either one, two, or four mod seven. And this is the cyclic subgroup generated by two plus seven Z. You look at all, this is a cyclic subgroup. It's all powers of this element. Okay. So this is a second cyclic subgroup 
contained in the group. Okay. So, I mean, you have to understand what is a group, what is a subgroup, and what is a cyclic subgroup, right? A cyclic subgroup is all powers of a fixed element. What about 3 plus 7z? That'd be the next thing to check. So, 3 plus 7z to the first power, I mean, in general, 3 plus anything, 7z to the kth power is 3 to the k plus 7z. So, we actually can make a table um, for the different values of k. What is 3 to the k plus 7z? So k is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. 3 to the 0 is 1. I'll just I'll forget the 1, this plus 7z. 3 to the first power is 3. 3 squared is 9. 9 is 2 mod 7. 3 cubed is 27. That's 6 mod 7. 3 to the fourth is 81. 81 is 4 mod 7. 3 to the 5th is 3 times 3 to the 4th, that's 12, which is 5 mod 7. 3 to the 6th is 3 times 3 to the 5th, which is 15, which is 1 mod 7. We're back where we started. So if you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 plus 7z, you get every congruence class, 1 through 6 mod 7. This is the whole group, Z mod 7Z star. So in particular, every congruence class relatively prime to 7 is the power of 3 mod 7. So this means 3 is a primitive root mod 7. That's the definition of a primitive root. The cyclic subgroup generated by that element is the whole group of units mod 7. What about 4 plus 7z? So 4 plus 7z to the kth power, that's 4 to the k plus 7z. What do we get for different values of k? This is 4 to the k mod 7. When k is 0, 4 to the 0 is 1. When k is 1, 4 to the first power is 4. When k is 2, 4 squared is 16, which is 2. When k is 3, 4 cubed is 64, which is back to 1 mod 7. So the cyclic subgroup generated by 4 plus 7z consists of the three congruence classes, 1 plus 7z, 2 plus 7z, 4 plus 7z. And you'll notice this is exactly the same subgroup as the cyclic subgroups generated by 2. 2 plus 7z and 4 plus 7z generate the same cyclic subgroups. What about 5 plus 7z? So 5 plus 7z to the k is 5 to the k plus 7z for different values. What do we get for 5 to the k mod 7. 5 to the 0 is 1. Of course, we know 5 to the 6th is 1 because v of 7 is equal to 6, and 5 to the 6 has to be congruent to 1 mod 7. That's all this theorem. Fermat's theorem. 5 to the first power is 5. 5 squared is 25 mod 7. That's 4. 5 cubed is 125 mod 7. That's 6. See, 5 to the 4th is like 5 squared squared. That's 4 times 4. That's 16 is 2 mod 7. 5 to the 5th power is like 5 cubed times 5 squared. That's 24 mod 7, that's 3, and that's it. So in fact, we get every congruence class mod 7. So the cyclic subgroup generated by 5 plus 7z 
Again, it's the whole group. Z mod 7Z star. And then the last number to look at is 6 plus 7Z. What's that cyclic subgroup? Well, 6 squared is 36. is congruent to 1 mod 7. So this just consists of two congruence classes, 1 plus 7Z and 6 plus 7Z. So we see that there are four different cyclic subgroups of Z mod 7Z. So if we make a list, cyclic subgroups of Z mod 7Z star. We have, first of all, the trivial subgroup consisting of just one. We have the subgroup almost trivial, consisting of 1 plus 7z and 6 plus 7z. We have the subgroup consisting of the four con three congruence classes, 1 plus 7z, 2 plus 7z, 4 plus 7z. And then finally, we have the whole group, z mod 7z star. So there's six elements in this multiplicative group. There, we look at the cyclic subgroup each generates. One generates this. Another element generates this. Two different elements, one and uh, two and four generate this subgroup. And two different elements, three and six generate this subgroup. So there are four different cyclic subgroups contained in Z mod 7Z star. So, so it's a simply stated problem, but you have to understand these definitions and concepts from group theory to be ordered to answer the question. Right. So there's some work involved in doing this exercise. <laughs> Right. Any questions about this? Other problems that I should do? I see the next problem, number 19, is also of the same type. Let me do it. It is to show that prove Z mod 11Z star is cyclic and find the generator. So Z mod 11Z star, this is a group of order 10. It has 10 elements the congruence classes one through 10. And we want to find an integer a relatively prime to n such that a has order 10 mod 11. That means the smallest number k such that smallest positive integer k such that a to the k is congruent to 1 mod 11 is 10. So all we can do is try one error. 1 is obviously not going to work because 1 to the first power is 1. What about 2? Let's see. So what are the powers of 2? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. 32 
is 2 to the 5th. 32 is congruent to minus 1 mod 11. Now, the order of A divides phi of 11, which is 10. Divisors of 10 are 1, 2, 5, and 10. So 2 to the first power is not congruent to 1, mod 11. 2 squared, which is 4, is not congruent to 1, mod 11. 2 to the fifth, which is 32, is not congruent to 1, mod 11. The only thing left is... 2 to the 10th. Well, 2 to the 10th is congruent to 1 mod 11. And that's the smallest. 10 is the smallest power of 2 congruent to 1 mod 11. So Z mod 11 star, that multiplicative group of order 10, is cyclic and it's generated by the congruence class 2 plus 11z. So 2 plus 11z, the cyclic group generated by this, is this whole group z mod 11z star. We could look for another generator. Suppose we try, so maybe look for a different generator. There can be more than one. Suppose I take A equal three. So three squared is nine. It's not congruent to one mod 11. Three cubed is 27, which is congruent to five mod 11. So, sorry, 3 to the square is, is 9 is not congruent to 1 mod 11. It's congruent to 9. 3 to the 5th, that's 3 squared times 3 cubed, because 2 plus 3 is 5. That's congruent to 9 times 5, which is 45, which is congruent to 1 mod 11. So the order of 3 mod 11 is 5, not 10. So three is not a generator of the cyclic group. And if we're curious, we could try other congruence classes and see if there are more generators. Any other questions you might have? So on Monday, we started a new topic, which in the book is in chapter three. And I uploaded the first part of this chapter to Blackboard, the part that has to do with primitive roots. This is uh, on Blackboard in the section on course materials. <laughs> and so we have for every positive integer. M, we have the additive group Z mod MZ of congruence classes mod M, and it has M elements, it's of order M. And we also have the multiplicative group.
z mod mz star, which consists of all congruence classes a plus mz, where the greatest common divisor of a and m is one. And this group has order phi of m, where phi is the Euler phi function. And you say that um, A plus MZ is a unit in the ring, the in the ring. It's a ring because you can add and multiply congruence classes. If There exists a B plus MZ such that A plus MZ times B plus MZ is one plus MZ. That's what we mean by a unit. This times this is this is one, the multiplicative identity. Or equivalently, A M A B plus mz equals one plus mz. Or if these are all equivalent statements, a b is congruent to one mod m. And we know that ax congruent to one mod m is solvable if and only if one is congruent to zero modulo the greatest common divisor of a and m which is the same as saying the greatest common divisor of a and m is one it's the only positive integer that divides one is one so this is what we've been using all the time the congruence class is relatively the units the elements of this multiplicative group are the congruence classes A plus MZ, where A and M is relatively prime, and there are exactly phi of M such congruent classes. That's the definition of the Euler phi function, which you should notice comes up over and over and over again in number theory. In some sense, the easiest groups to understand are cyclic groups because they're just powers of a fixed element. And it turns out that um, A plus MZ, this is a congruence class, an element of the ring Z mod MZ star, is called A or um, or suppose A, take A plus MZ. So A and M are relatively prime. Otherwise, A would not be in this group. A is a primitive root modulo M if Z mod MZ star is cyclic and generated by the congruence class A plus MZ, or equivalently, if and only if, A has order phi of M mod M. That is, 
the smallest positive integer k with a to the k congruent to 1 mod m. We know phi of m always works, but if phi of m is the smallest number that works, then a is called a primitive root mod m. And what is a big theorem in number theory is the following. It's not... So not every modulus m has a primitive root, but uh, every prime number p has a primitive root. So if you're given a prime number, there always exists some number a relatively prime to p, that means not divisible by p, which is a primitive root mod p. And it's actually computationally hard to compute primitive roots in the sense of computer science. That is, if you study computer science or computer programming, it's not enough to know that a program exists that will solve the problem. It has to be the case that if you run the program, it'll solve it in less than 100 billion years. Right? I mean, if it's going to take 100 billion years of computation to solve the problem, you don't really have a solution. So even though some problems are algorithmically solvable, you can write a computer program to solve it. If, it's too, if it involves too many computations, uh, it means it's computationally hard in some sense that can be quantified. It's not clear what it means to say that you can actually compute the solution. So for a large prime, to find a primitive root is difficult. For small primes, which are the only ones we deal with in this course, you can do it by hand, though it might take a lot of work. Okay. And... <laughs> so I'm going to prove that theorem. And it is a... Um, proof that involves a lot of algebra and number theory. And the little bit of algebra that we need has to do with polynomials. So we're going to look with, at polynomials with coefficients in a field. So if you only look at polynomials with integer coefficients, The integers don't form a field. They form a very nice ring, but not a field. You can't divide in, in the integers generally. But we're going to look at polynomials with coefficients in a field, like the rational numbers or the real numbers or the complex numbers. Um, so this just fix some notation. Um, so a polynomial f of x looks like... Um, a m x to the m, a m x to the m minus one, down to a one x plus a zero. So you could have f of x equals seven x to the thirteenth minus ten x to the fifth plus two x plus one. Right? This is a polynomial. A lot of the coefficients are zero. I mean, you could write this. Uh, I'm just leaving out the zero coefficients. That's what a polynomial looks like. And you spent a lot of time in calculus differentiating and integrating them. So this is called the zero polynomial. If all the coefficients are zero. And it's non-zero polynomial otherwise. So f of x equals 7x to the 13 minus 10x to the 5th plus 2x plus 1. 
you know, again, I could write this if I wanted, but it's kind of silly. 7x to the 13 plus 0x to the 12th plus 0x to the 11th and so on, right? Plus 0x to the 6th plus minus 10x to the 5th. And then, you know, I mean, I just don't bother to write the terms that have zeros usually, but there's no reason. I mean, you can do it if you want. That's not a problem. And I could even write this as 0 times x to the 14th plus this. And the degree of a non-zero polynomial, we do not define the degree of the zero polynomial. The degree of a non-zero polynomial is the largest m such that a m is different from zero. So it's the degree of the largest power of x that occurs in the polynomial with a non-zero coefficient. So the degree of this polynomial is 13. Of course, I have 7x to the 13. x to the 13 is the highest power of x that appears in the polynomial. And the degree, usually you write it deg, degree of f has two um, very nice properties. Um, the degree of the sum of two polynomials is at most the larger of the two degrees, uh, degree F and degree G. Because if you add two polynomials, like if one of them has the highest power 13 and the other has the highest power eight, when you add them, you're never going to get a power bigger than 13. Right? The degree of the sum of two polynomials is at most the larger of the two degrees of the polynomials, but you could have some cancellation. I mean, for example, if you had f of x is seven x to the 13 minus 10 x to the fifth plus two x plus one, and g of x is minus seven x to the 13 plus 2x to the 8th, plus 3x minus 100. If you add f plus g, these cancel. You get 2x to the 8th, minus 10x to the 5th, plus 5x, minus 99. So the degree of f plus g is eight, <laughs> which is less than the maximum of the degree of F and the degree of G, which is 13, right? Because each of these degrees is 13. F and G both have degree 13. So the maximum of 13 of 13 is 13, but you have this cancellation. So the degree of the sum is, in this example, less than 13, right? But it can't be any bigger than the greater of the degrees of the of the greater of the two degrees of the polynomials. Multiplication satisfies a simpler rule, namely, if f and g are non-zero polynomials the degree of f times g is the sum of the degrees. Again, you can see this. If, if for example, if f is um, 7x to the 13 plus some other, other stuff, and g is uh, 2x to the 8th, and some other stuff, lower terms, when you multiply them, the largest power you get is 2 times 7 is 14, x to the 21 plus lower order terms. So the degree of fg is 21, which is 13 plus 8, which is the degree of f plus the degree of g. In general, if f is am x to the m plus lower order terms, and g is bn x to the n plus lower order terms, 
when you mo and a m is non zero and b n is non zero when you multiply f g the highest power you get has a coefficient a m b n x to the m plus n plus lower order terms and if these two numbers are non zero so is their product so the degree of f g is m plus n which is the degree of f plus the degree of g So if f of x is 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, and g of x is 5x cubed minus x minus 7, what is the degree of f plus g? And what is the degree of f times g? Can someone tell me? If I add these two polynomials, what's the degree of the sum? Well, if I add f of x plus g of x, I get 5x cubed plus 2x squared plus 2x minus 6. So the degree of f plus g is 3, which is, in this case, the maximum of the numbers uh, 2 and 3. That is the maximum of degree f and degree g. And f times g, if I multiply these two polynomials, f times g is I get 10x to the fifth plus um, 15x to the fourth plus 5 minus 2 plus 3x cubed minus 14 minus 3 x squared minus 14 minus 3 minus 17 x squared minus 21 x minus x minus 22 x minus 7. And if I multiplied correctly, this is what I get. And the degree of fg is 5, which you will notice is 2 plus 3. That is the degree of f plus the degree of g. So polynomials with coefficients in a field are very nice. They're very like integers in some ways. And with integers, there's a division algorithm. Similarly, with polynomials, there's a division algorithm. And the division algorithm says the following. So this is the division algorithm. For polynomials. So we have a field. F. Like the real numbers or the rational numbers or the complex numbers. If F of X. And D of X are polynomials in this polynomial ring with coefficients in f and the polynomial d is not zero you can't divide by zero then there exist so exist is a big word unique unique is a big word polynomials 
of x and r of x in this polynomial ring. <coughs> Q stands for quotient and R stands for a remainder. Q of X and R of X. Such that if you divide F of X by d of x, you get a quotient q of x and a remainder r of x, where q and r are unique and either r is equal to zero or the degree of r is strictly smaller than the degree of d, which is the polynomial you're dividing by. So I want to prove this. And the proof goes as follows. Um, suppose we let d of x, it's a non-zero polynomial, let's say its degree is m, d sub m x to the m, plus d sub m minus one, x to the m minus one, these decreasing powers of x, b one x plus b zero, and this leading coefficient b sub m is not zero. So the degree of d is equal to m. And there are two cases. Look at what first of all, d of x divides with no remainder f of x. That is, f of x is d of x q of x plus zero. Right? So we have, well, so in this case, f is d times q plus zero. In the second case, d of x does not divide f of x with no remainder. So f of x minus d of x q of x is different from zero for all polynomials q. This difference is never zero. Otherwise, d divides f. So f of x minus d of x q of x is a non-zero polynomial, and it has a degree. So if we look at this, let l be the degree of f minus dq. So this is a non-negative integer. It could be zero, it could be positive, right? But there's always, for every q, f minus dq is not zero. So this is a non-zero polynomial and it has a degree. And every set of non-negative integers has the smallest integer. That's the minimum principle, which we use again and again and again. Choose L minimal, that is, let L be the least degree of F minus DQ for any polynomial Q. So this means that F of X minus D of X Q of X is some polynomial uh, R of X of degree L, C sub L, X to the L, plus lower order terms, C1, X, 
plus c zero. C sub L is different from zero. So I let A be the smallest non-negative integer that is of the form the degree of F minus DQ for some polynomial Q. I claim that the degree of this remainder L is strictly, we know it's non-negative. I claim this is strictly smaller than degree of D, which is equal to M. So I claim that this remainder polynomial R has degree L strictly smaller than M. And this will be a proof by contradiction. So let me see, I have F minus F of X minus D of X, Q of X is in this polynomial R of X. And D has degree M. The degree of D is equal to M. The degree of R is equal to L. And we're going to assume that L is greater than or equal to M and derive, get, some contradiction. So let's see. f of x minus d of x, q of x, is r of x, which is c sum l x to the l, plus lower order terms, like that. Now, let's see. d of x, the degree of D was M. So D of X is some polynomial degree M and some leading coefficient B sub M plus B1 X plus B naught and B M is different from zero. Just as here, if this has degree L, C L is different from zero. So if L is greater than or equal to M, then L minus M is greater than or equal to zero. And if we consider the polynomial D of X multiplied by the scalar B M inverse, one over B sub M, times C sub L, X to the L minus M. This is a polynomial. See, this is all non-zero. This has degree M. This has degree L minus M. It's a polynomial of degree L. And what is the leading coefficient of this? You see, if you take D of X and you multiply by B M inverse, the coefficient of X to the M the BM times BM inverse cancels. The coefficient of X to the M becomes one times C sub L. This is a polynomial of degree L with leading coefficient C sub L. That is D of X, B sub M inverse, C sub L X to the L minus M is equal to C sub L X to the L plus some lower order terms. So if I take f of x minus d of x, q of x, recall that was equal to cl x to the l plus lower order terms plus c1x plus c0. But I also subtract this polynomial minus 
B of X, B sub M inverse C sub L, X to the L minus M. I'm subtracting a polynomial that starts C sub L, X to the L. And when I get on this side, because these cancel, is a polynomial of degree at most L minus one. And the highest power of X on the right-hand side it's going to be at most L minus one. And this, this is F of X minus D of X factored out the D of X. This is Q of X plus BM inverse CL X to the L minus M. This is some polynomial. I can call it Q prime of X if I like. But F of X minus D of X times this gives me a polynomial of degree at most L minus one. But that can't be possible. This contradicts the minimality of L. L is the degree of this, it's the smallest degree of a polynomial that can be written in the form F minus D DQ. And we got that contradiction by assuming L was greater than or equal to M so therefore, it must be that L is strictly less than M. In other words, I can write F minus DQ. <laughs> it's equal to some polynomial R of degree less than M. So this is the existence part. So this proves existence. Let me say what I mean by existence. So given F and D polynomials with D different from zero, there exist polynomials Q and R with F of X equals D of X, Q of X plus R of X, and either R of X equals zero or the degree of R is strictly smaller than the degree of D. So there exists at least one such decomposition. And I want to assume there's a second one. So suppose, suppose also we have polynomial Q1 and R1 with f of x equals d of x q1 of x plus r1 of x. And again, either r1 of x is zero or the degree of r1 is strictly smaller than the degree of d. So I have this relation and this relation. So if this equals f of x and this equals f of x, they're equal to each other. D of X, Q of X plus R of X equals D of X, Q1 of X plus R1 of X. If I rearrange this, D of X, Q of X minus D of X, Q1 of X is R1 of X minus R of X. And I can factor the D out of this. This is D of X Q of X minus Q1 of X. So this times this equals this. Now, the degree of R1 is less than the degree of D. The degree of R is less than the degree of D. So when I subtract, the degree of R1 minus R is less than the maximum of these two degrees is going to be less than the degree of D. So on the right-hand side, either R1 equals R or the degree of the difference, R1 minus R is non-zero and the degree of the difference is less than the degree of the D. On the other hand, what do we have on the left-hand side? We have a product of two polynomials. If Q of X minus Q1 of X 
is not equal to zero, then the degree of Q minus Q1 is greater than or equal to zero. And the degree of D times Q minus Q1, which is the degree of a product is the sum of the degrees. But or in this case, the difference, yeah, the sum of the degrees, degree D plus degree of Q minus Q prime, Q1. But this is at least positive. So this is greater than or equal to the degree of D. So if Q is different from Q1, the left-hand side has degree at least D, but the right-hand side has degree smaller than D. And that's a contradiction, because the left side equals the right side. So therefore, it has to be that Q equals Q1 and R equals R1. So that proves uniqueness. That's the proof of the division algorithm. But of course, that's exactly what you learned in pre-calculus or high school algebra, where you should have learned how to do long division of polynomials. So let's say you have f of x is x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. v of x is x squared plus 5x minus 9. And you want to divide. You want to write f as f of x is some d of x times the quotient q of x plus r of x. So you're just dividing d of x into f of x and looking for the remainder. x squared plus 5x minus 9 divided into x fourth minus 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. x into x to the fourth goes x squared. I get x to the fourth plus 5x cubed minus 9x squared. When I subtract, I get minus 5x cubed plus 7x squared plus 3x plus 1. x squared into this goes minus 5x times. I get minus 5x cubed minus 25x squared plus 45x. I subtract these cancel. I get 32x squared minus 42x plus 1. x squared to this goes 32 times. I get 32x squared plus 160x <coughs> minus 9 times 32, which is 288, I think. I subtract, I get minus 164x plus 289. So this is my quotient, and this is my remainder. I'm dividing by a polynomial of degree two, so the remainder has degree at most one, and in this case, it has degree exactly one. So it's nice to see when high school algebra fits into the context of what we're doing. Any questions about this? Okay. So then we prove one more theorem, theorem 3.2, which says the following. So we have a polynomial f of x. I mean, let's say c is a zero or a root, they're synonymous of f of x if when you plug in x equals c and evaluate you get zero so <coughs> so the theorem says the following that f of x be a polynomial in the ring of polynomials with coefficients in the field capital F, and f of x is not the zero polynomial. 
let n0 of f denote the number of distinct zeros of f of x in f, then the number of distinct zeros is at most the degree of f. So for example, you have f of x equals um, x squared minus 10x plus 21. f of 3 is 9 minus 30 plus 21 is 0. And f of 7 is 49 minus 70 plus 21 is zero. So three and seven are roots of this polynomial. In fact, you can check they're the only roots because f of x actually factors into x minus three, x minus seven. So if you plug in any number for x other than three and seven, both factors are non-zero and the product is non-zero. You take f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 1. f of 1 is 1 minus 2 plus 1 is 0. So 1 is a root. But there's no other root. Because, in fact, this is equal to x minus 1 squared. So if you plug in x equal 1, you get 0. But if you plug in any other number, you don't get 0. So in this case, n0 of f is 2. In this case, n0 of f is 1. So the big theorem says that for any polynomial f of x non-zero, the number of distinct zeros of the polynomial is at most the degree. So let me prove that. So this is theorem in the book. It's theorem 3.2, but I'm not sure what it is in the notes that I posted. We have a polynomial f of x with coefficients in the field x. f of x is not the zero polynomial. Then the number of distinct zeros of f is at most the degree of f. So the proof is using 
the division algorithm. So let alpha be any scale or any number in F. And we divide F of X by X minus alpha. So F of X is going to be X minus alpha Q of X plus the remainder. And either the remainder is zero or the degree of the remainder is less than the degree of what we're dividing by, x minus alpha, which is one, which means either r of x equals zero or the degree of r is equal to zero because the only non-negative integer less than one is zero. Degree r equals zero means r is a non-zero number or r is equal to zero. So r of x is some element of the field. And what is that equal to? If you evaluate this polynomial at x equal alpha, f of alpha is alpha minus alpha q of alpha plus r of alpha. Alpha minus alpha is zero. So this is just r of alpha. So the scale or r of x is equal to f of x. Oh, so we have f of x is equal to x minus alpha q of x plus f of alpha for all alpha in the field. So alpha is a root. That means f of alpha equals zero. That means f of x is x minus alpha q of x. This is zero. So x minus alpha divides f of x. So if alpha is a root of a polynomial, the polynomial is divisible by x minus alpha. Suppose that beta is another root, not equal to alpha. Then f of beta is beta minus alpha Q of beta, that's equal to zero. But if beta is different from alpha, this is not zero. So Q of beta is zero, which means beta is a root of Q. So Q of X is divisible by X minus beta times some other polynomial Q one of X. So F of X is X minus alpha Q of X, which is X minus beta q1 of x. And continuing step by step in this way, we see that if alpha 1, alpha 2 up to alpha k are distinct roots of f of x, then f of x is divisible by x minus alpha 1 x minus alpha 2, x minus alpha k, times some polynomial q of x and the remainder. But now, the degree of f equals the degree of this right-hand side, which is the sum of the degrees. This plus, because the degree of a product is the sum of the degrees of the factors. Each of these has degree one. So this is one plus one K plus the degree of Q, which is greater than or equal to K. So in particular, if we let K be the, all, be the number of distinct zeros, we get degree of F is greater than or equal to N zero of K. And that's what we wanted to prove. So the number of distinct zeros of a polynomial <coughs> is at most the degree. That's the result. And 
on Wednesday, uh, I'll prove the theorem that every prime number P has a primitive root. And it's based on a theorem in group theory. So this is theorem 3.3. Um, it says that let G be a finite subgroup of a multiplicative group of a field, then G is always cyclic. So in a field, every finite subgroup is cyclic. And of course, if P is prime, Z mod PZ is a field. And Z mod PZ star is a finite subgroup. P is finite. P is a prime. So this has exactly P minus one elements. This is a cyclic subgroup of the multiplicative group of a field. In fact, it's the whole subgroup. So this is cyclic. And a generator is a primitive root. So this very pretty theorem in group theory will tell us, will prove for us the existence of primitive roots. So this is the first few pages in chapter three. And there is a lot of if you like theoretical material here to think about. And but this is what we're doing now and for the rest of the term. And a large part of the midterm will involve these algebraic type arguments and number theory. It's really the core of our subject. So that's what it is. Any questions about that? Uh, if not, then we're done for the morning. I'll be adding some homework and some uh, problem sessions, and uh, uh, and I'll let and I have to put together a review sheet for the midterm, which will be after Thanksgiving, and we'll see exactly when. Okay, that's it for for today. Then uh, be well, everyone. Do we have um class next Wednesday? Why not? I think I mean it's just, if it's a scheduled day, then we certainly have class. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um. Someone said there's no class. Looking Next one. Schedule. Oh, you are right. No class Wednesday, November twenty second. So next week we have class on Monday only. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Be well, everyone.